This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Susie Hopkins and Haley Bateman. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Kristen. And we're two educators with advanced degrees talking about comics. And on this interview episode, Kristen and I have the pleasure of talking with Susie Hopkins and Hallie Bateman. Their new book, What to Do When I'm Gone, A Mother's Wisdom to Her Daughter, comes out very soon from Bloomsbury Publications, and we have a really nice conversation with those creators. But before we get to that, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes you can find specials at 45% off of the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but every now and again you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. And as they do every month, Discount Comic Book Service offers a variety of different bundles at incredible discounts, and you can usually get those at 50% off of the cover price. You'll find that on a regular basis, they have bundles from DC Comics, Marvel, and Valiant, among others. So definitely check out the great discounts at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. Well, Kristen, um, listeners of the Comics Alternative may be scratching their heads and <laughs> wondering, who is this Kristen person? And uh, what is she doing on the podcast? And you know, we, we can we can talk in a moment about how you and I came to do this interview together. But uh, if you could introduce yourself to our listeners, I will do that. Um, so my name is Kristen Lalone, and I am a co-host of the Comics in Libraries podcast, Secret Stacks. I host that with Thomas Malik. We're both librarians. Thomas is a teen librarian, and I'm a uh, hospital librarian and we both have a lot of, we have very different but uh, quite extensive experience in the world of comics in libraries so we talk about comics news how to build collections how to do programming with comics in libraries and we review we review uh, different books that come out so we tr we update twice a month and you can Find us on all your various podcatchers, iTunes, Stitcher, etc. But you can find our recaps and our show notes and all those sorts of things on our website, secretstacks.com. Yeah, and um, I do recommend that listeners check out your podcast. And, you know, they don't have to necessarily be into libraries or have an interest in libraries and graphic novels. I find it insightful uh, to listen to what you and Thomas have to say. And and I've been subscribing to your podcast and listening to it for quite a while. And I'll, and I'll tell you how I found out about Secret Stacks. I think it was about a year ago. I saw that... Um, and it may have been Thomas, but it was it was someone on Twitter who oh had, yeah it was, it was Thomas he runs the Twitter account so okay. that's definitely him yeah and and he he tagged uh, tagged us on Twitter because apparently he had mentioned us on one of your shows oh yeah Thomas is a voracious comics podcast listener so he's he's always on it with that sort of stuff. 
And so I looked it up. I checked you out. I listened to that episode, and <laughs> I was, you know, first off, pleased that he mentioned the comics alternative <laughs> on the Secret Stacks. Uh, but but also, I liked what I heard. And so since then, I've been subscribing to your feed and listen to it often. Yeah, you know, we try to keep things light. We try to keep it funny because we all we a lot of times we find librarians who are in charge of the comics and graphic novel collection in the library aren't necessarily comics fans. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. And when you jump, when you get kind of thrown into the world of buying graphic novels, it can be very overwhelming. And we used to get questions all the time from colleagues. It was like, well, what do I buy? What do I do? How do, how does Marvel work? What does anything mean? What is this? So we're like, oh, well, there was a, we saw a, a need in our career area and we decided to fill it but it's not to say kind of what you were saying we don't only talk about library stuff we just try to keep basically we just try to keep the library world up to date with what's going on in the comics world so you know i think anybody would find it interesting i would hope oh yeah yeah i think all of our listeners should definitely check out the secret stacks now getting to the subject matter of this particular episode and how you and i came to do this interview together i was listening to i guess it was a relatively recent episode of the secret stacks maybe about two episodes ago it was sometime in march and i heard at the tail end of that particular episode you mentioned something to the listeners you said that uh You'd like to find out about other texts that deal with how to deal with the passing of a loved one, a family mm-hmm. member, or how to prepare for something like that. And like about a few days before I heard that, uh, I had reached out to Bloomsbury about a book that I had seen referenced somewhere. I think it was in the previews catalog. Uh, what to do when I'm gone, a mother's wisdom to her daughter. And I started to talk with the publicist there about the possibility of interviewing the authors, Susie Hopkins and Hallie Bateman on the show. And then I heard your podcast and I thought this would be a great opportunity, not only to let you know about this book, uh, Mm -hmm. but also for, I guess, what we could call a podcast crossover. (laughs) Absolutely. I think it was kismet. Yes. It made it made it happen. Yes. And uh, yeah, definitely. That's definitely true. And there's a on the podcast, like we mentioned, like I mentioned, we review a lot of books. And for a while, I I was reading a lot about either people taking care of family members who are dying or people who are going through different health problems and. And I'm like, well, you know, I feel like I've read them all and I was hoping to get some input and it worked out really well because I love this book. Yes. And we really did have a nice time talking with Hallie and Susie. So let's go ahead and get to that conversation right now. Sounds great. We're really pleased to have on the podcast Susie Hopkins and Hallie Bateman. They are the creators behind the new book from Bloomsbury, What to Do When I'm Gone, A Mother's Wisdom to Her Daughter. Susie, Hallie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. So you might not be aware, I'm a librarian at a hospital and one of the collections that we have in my library is called graphic medicine which is basically talking about medical subjects in graphic novel format and actually quite a few of the books deal with the passing of a loved one and i thought your book was a perfect example of graphic medicine in this way and what i was curious about is if you were thinking possible audience for this book uh people whose maybe their parents have not passed yet but are kind of um 
in the it get, in the hospital point of view, that's they consider that to be like palliative care or like end of life care. So when you were putting the book together, did you have a specific audience in mind? Well, for me, I think the when the the idea originated, the audience was just myself because I I selfishly I just wanted the book for my own my own comfort and my own use, and it wasn't until we actually started to work on it together and to write it that we kind of we saw the ideas coming out and we thought that it could be useful for a wider audience and kind of for everyone. What do you think, Mom? Well, I agree. I had absolutely no audience in mind because this was just a side project with Hallie that was answering her basically demands for this this <laughs> set of advice. And for myself, my only other thought about audience is that I have two sons that are uh, 26 and 30. Sally's in the, the middle of the group. And my advice is was meant equally for them. So that was honestly, it was no more sophisticated than that. It was just for the kids. And then it expanded from there because we were, as we were writing it on the first go round, it was so intense uh, as we were, Hallie was asking these questions that I began to see it as something more universal. Now, Hallie, in your introduction you do explain the what what seems to be the the origins of this project yeah and where you know you were wondering one night okay what would i do you know when my mother passes um the questions that i had the comforting that i would normally go to her for that won't be there anymore so what do i do um does this really reflect uh, the, the the genesis of this book, or is there more to that brief introduction? Um, that introduction is a really, really the encapsulation of of how it happened. I, my mom and I have always had a very close relationship, and it's kind of like you know, ever since I have been living on my own and dealing with trying to become an adult. I mean, there's like weekly phone calls that would be like this thing happened at work and like what should I do or like how do I know if a tomato is like rotten or like I don't know just like random <laughs> random random life questions that come up that like I could google it but I would rather ask my mom and um and I think that in the introduction I just express what dawned on me one night when I was 23 which was thinking about the reality of my mom's absence um, when she does pass away, that I would, that not only that she would die and that that would suck, it would be the permanence of it. And that the daily, like things would just keep going and she wouldn't be there. And I was totally freaked out and realized, I just thought, I would be paralyzed. Like I tried to imagine doing anything and I thought like I couldn't. <laughs> and so when I came to her with the, the idea for the book, I just thought like it would be an easy solution that would be kind of forcing her to parent me after her death. <laughs> um, and luckily she has a good sense of humor and she liked it. <laughs> Now, is this the first time the two of you have worked on a project like this together? Any, any, any professional project? Um, well, actually, I did. I forget. A few years, a few years before, um, I was making comics for a website um, called the Bygone Bureau, um, which is kind of how I got my start um, in illustration was through them, and. Um, I had come across some of my mom's journals from when she was 17 and she traveled to Europe and she just, she, I was like, can I read these? And she's like, Oh yeah, go for it. Um, so just like me, she's kind of been a journaler, um, throughout her life. And, um, so I read them and they were really funny. It was like, she was traveling through Europe, like abroad for the first time and like had a boyfriend back home that she would like, wax poetic about him being so cute and then like 
there was just really like funny, really funny entries that I loved. And I ended up one of them. She just she wrote a guide to kissing, like how how you should go about kissing someone really tall if you're really short or like (laughs) all these little it was just like total kind of parody type stuff. But um, I ended up illustrating it um, like a guide to kissing that she wrote. And it was I felt like I was collaborating with her through time travel or something. So that was my first first time um, working with her writing. But when I was a kid, my mom would um, be submitting stories to children's magazines, like children's literature magazines and stuff. And um, I remember, mom, do you remember this? Like I would always ask you if I could illustrate them. No, but I don't remember much. Oh, <laughs> I did. I would always, I would always be like, can I, il-? like, she'd be packing it in an envelope and I'd be like, can I illustrate it? And you were like, yeah, I mean, you like, let me enclose illustrations in it, even if they were going to obviously publish it with their own illustrations. They were going to have like an eight year old child illustrate their magazine. But, um, I think that looking back, it's not that surprising that we ended up doing this. Although it's not like it made sense at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, yeah, that's a good explanation. <laughs> Hallie was like a, a pesky mosquito to get this book done because I had a, a community magazine for people 50 and older that I started and uh, ran from 2008 to 2017. And Hallie, yeah, you know, I was crazy, overworked and stressed and, um, and uh, really um, took on a, a bigger project than I expected. And Hallie just kept um, asking for this advice and that um that's the only reason we did this book is because of hallie's persistence on on getting this actual um advice from me i kept telling her that uh like mom you're gonna get hit by a bus and i'm not gonna have the book like (laughs) you have to make it and actually i was hit by a drunk driver and my car totaled in 2013 and i thought boy that was a close one and um, and after that, you know, I, I realized that uh, that can happen to any of us. And and um, it, it gave me a little bit more uh, impetus to to uh, agree to her demands, let's say. You're making me sound really like strict. And <laughs> well, honestly, you were so persistent. And I just, you know, it turned out to be the right thing. But because on it, you know, I just never would have done it, Hallie, if we if you hadn't insisted, because there's always something that seems more important. Um, yeah. And in fact, it's it's not when it comes to recording family history. It's it's seems hard to find the time, but it, its value so far outweighs the investment of time. I, I think it does. It actually, it kind of parallels with a lot of people talking about any kind of end of life preparations because mm-hmm. I've had I've had to have that conversation with my own with my own mother, where it's like, okay, I work at a hospital. We talk about uh, advanced, you know, advanced care planning, and uh-huh. like, you know, nobody wants to. Everyone wants to kind of like, well, you know, I've got time, and then. Unfortunately, sometimes it's like a medical emergency or something that kind of like, oh, actually. You know, we should do this now. So I think that's great that you you guys really push to get this done because I feel like a lot of people end up in kind of a situation where they where it's a it's a topic people don't really want to talk about until they're forced to talk about it. So I think it's really yeah. great. Exactly. And one of the things we're most I'm personally most excited about is I'm a believer that at least it wasn't true with my parents' generation. Nobody said anything. Death was just sort of a, you just didn't talk about it. And I really believe that time has come for families to have those earlier conversations and have them, you know, there's some of them are very difficult to have, but I wouldn't have wanted to wait until I was in my seventies or eighties. Cause who, who knows how much time I have and you, you take it for granted, I think. And I think that um, while you still are, you know, kind of in the in the health of your life is is a good time to do this reflection. And your kids are young adults, not just waiting until your kids are sixty and seventy, because you know who knows if you'll make it that long. You know, as you were mentioning, I mean, this may not be the most <laughs> joyful topic to discuss, but one of the things that struck me in reading this book is the humor. Uh, and and I see this both in the text, Susie, that that you've provided, and also in Hallie's art. And I'm wondering if this 
intention on embedding this narrative with humor was something that you planned to do from the get-go, maybe as a way of tempering the more, I don't know, darker or depressing, foreboding subject matter that you're dealing with here? Uh, well, for for my case, um, in, in my case, I, I lost my mom at the, uh, she died at the age of 85 in 2003. And I was um, at her side when she died. And and my sister did the primary caregiving for her in the years preceding that. And um, we found, and this was before I started a senior magazine, we found that Steph was so baffling in the caregiving realm of your elderly parent that without humor, you would just, you know, crawl in a closet and pull a blanket over your head because, you know, she'd walk in the bathroom and drop a hearing aid in the toilet and you would just go, wow, that was like a $500 hearing aid. And you're trying to be a gentle, loving caregiver, but the stuff that happens that we're not prepared for my sister and I found, and we are kind of smart alky to begin with, but my, my sister and I found that humor was the only way to get through. And as you know, the stats on caregivers and how very difficult it is for them from a health perspective, a mental health perspective to, to make it through sometimes, sometimes they die before their person they're in charge of or charged with the care of. And, um, we just found it was almost a life-saving device, so there was no particular intention with the book. It just reflects what we, um, I think, are my personal style and Hallie's style, which is uh, um, to humor helps you get through. I think that's the point. Yeah, I think that um, that like from the very very beginning of even when I brought up the idea to my mom. There's a, there's the sincere part that's like, I really can't imagine living without you. This is going to suck. Like I need help with grieving. But then there's also just like, like the idea itself is kind of funny because it's thinking that you're going to cheat death or grief, which is not really possible. And then, I don't know, like part of what is part of what I'm afraid of with losing my mom is like the funny person that she is. And so it's not just like the darkness that I wanted to, to keep carrying, or I guess it's not just consolation that I wanted to carry with me. It's kind of like her voice and her like humor about things. And I don't know, like there's pages in the book that are just like, I'm just dead. Deal with it. Like (laughs) it's, it's like, it's that kind of no bullshit, funny, tone that is part of just my mom's natural way of being that um I think just it was not even a question that the book would would be funny so well also I'm a practical person so yeah (laughs) an an example of the humor and this is one of my favorite uh entries and by the way the the book is written in the first person you know as if Susie has been listing these are some of the things that you need to consider after I die. And so under day three, your instruction is brush the dog, get all the tangles out of his fur. It's not the (laughs) dog's fault. I died. Unless of course it was the dog's fault, in which case brushing him may not be your highest priority. (laughs) I appreciated that. Uh, We like our dogs here. We're very fond of dogs. (laughs) And we should mention to, to, to listeners that the way that what to do when I'm gone is structured it begins with what at first seems to be a day by day checklist of, you know, on day one, you should do this, on day two, so on and so forth. But then once you get into the teens and 20s, then you start condensing time, so to speak, and then skip ahead to, let's say, 25, day 42. Uh, and, and you go, um, God, quite a number of days. What is it? Uh, uh, tw- I think it's 20,000. Yeah, day 20,000, yeah. The math was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> the math was very challenging, and it kept shifting it. And, that, and I, I predicated on, well, maybe I dropped in when Hallie was 35. And then and then doing all the math, and go, well, how long would you have to live? And then it's even interesting to know how many days and minutes that you have yeah. left. Because you go, wow, that's a finite number, isn't it? And I think yeah. whatever you 
that you are, it, it continues to re-surprise you that it's a finite number. It does me. I was definitely doing some of the math when it was going like in chunks of 1,000. I'm like, all right, so there's 365 days in a year. So was that around three and a half years? <laughs> so I was just like, okay. And then I, okay, that was kind of about kids and here's the gestation periods. So <laughs> it was, it was that specific. It was funny. It was fun to do actually. And it was kind of intentional in considering that like in the, in the initial weeks and years after losing someone is probably when you're going to need the most like counseling, I guess, or, you know, to turn to the, to the book. And then it, starts to be less about grief and just it starts to be more about my mom's advice on things that are just happening in life um, that I might want to talk to her about but can't. Yeah, and actually I was going to point out, it seems like just at first blush, it seems to be about a book about death, but when you actually read the whole book, it's more it's a book about life in general, just like how to live life and yeah. when I when I was going through it I there was a number of times where I was like I should talk to my mother more because <laughs> like the obituary section oh, yeah. was like I'm like oh. I don't even know what I would I don't even know what I would write I should actually try to find out what my mom does when I'm not when <laughs> I'm not around yeah totally that that's a good point. And when, before my mom died, um, I, I'm a journalist, and I said, "Well, gee, I don't know about our much about our family history. We had a pretty dysfunctional family, and and um, so a lot of stuff hadn't been discussed, basically. And and I would have been unable to do her obituary. I was able, but only because I I asked her to do a series of interviews with me um, in her in her mid 80s before she passed, and. Uh, and as a result of that, I was able to do a obituary. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been able to. So it was, it was somewhat accidental. But I knew, I knew that um, I had about a year to to gather that information. So, yeah, you even give good suggestions on what not to do with an obituary. Oh, that's that, and that's a pet peeve of mine because you know a lot of people have to pay to put this stuff in now, so the family writes it because the smaller papers don't have the staff to do it. And, you know, some of them are just, um, you just go, wow, that's, that's, that's all you can come up with. That's in, in just very obscure things that don't really have to do with their, their time here. And perhaps what was of the most value. And I'm not sure if that's because, you know, in some cases people, you know, aren't particularly good writers in other cases, they, they may not know, or they, um, they don't have any time or they're, they, they died and the only family that is related is across country and really doesn't know much of anything, but they feel compelled to put the obituary in. So what's your biggest pet peeve yeah. on obituaries? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, um, it is that, that uh, there's something about, I wrote something about dinky, my beloved dachshund. It's just these really <laughs> obscure, and you can love your dog and your dog can be listed in a, your obituary, but you, you're, you're loving your dachshund isn't the best representation of the life that you lived. And so th that kind of extremely obscure detail in the absence of anything else is probably my pet peeve, but I have a number of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely come across those at, at like at a funeral where it's like this, the whoever's doing it, like lists off three very random facts. I'm like, okay, you did, you did not know this person at all. Yes. Oh, so sad. But there's a requirement to say something. So, right. yeah. And that, of course, in my ideal world, everybody would write their own obituary because I think it would be funnier and uh, unless they were lying you know more accurate because they would perhaps you know know what their form their life actually took so so um i think you should do your own and prepare it well ahead of time that would be my choice well even i think that's a good exercise in general because it helps you kind of like just like it's good to keep your resume up to date i think it's good to keep your <laughs> obituary up to date you know like oh yeah i actually did do a bunch of stuff yeah, yeah. So like, like any life review, it can be great for you to examine that before you're on your deathbed. Right. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was really happy to see in your book is not only a variety of helpful advice pieces, but recipes. And in fact, uh, at, at times reading this book, I got quite hungry. 
<laughs> well, it's comfort food. That's, you know, it's, it's absolute comfort food. Yeah, you have me wanting to make chicken and dumplings, which I haven't done in years. Yeah, yeah. And the, um, the uh, you know, I, I'm the kind of cook that I kind of remember how to do it. And I've done it that way for years and, it's, you know, how my mom made it. And, and in the chicken dumplings, I go, I, I better step up my game with these recipes and do some actual measuring. And that chicken and dumplings took about, I swear, about 10 tries. And I probably put on 10 pounds and, and it just, they do, dumplings are like, they just stick like glue. And it, it was my least favorite recipe testing because, uh, I had to do it so many times and we just got sick of eating chicken and dumplings, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, down home country cooking. So still enjoy it. Well, I'm wondering about the process of creation now, but now both of you live in California, but in different places in the state. So mm -hmm. when you were in the midst of, let's say first conceiving of the project, discussing what it would be going back and forth in terms of the text, as well as the art, I mean, how did you do so? Well, um, the idea actually started a few years before the, we even began to write. So when I was around 23, I approached my mom about it and she like agreed to write the book. And then a few years passed and I, I moved to New York and I would bug my mom, as she mentioned, about writing it. And I think because I was expecting her to just write me this book and like deliver it to me, it was hard to to like, you know, impose any seriousness to that. So um, she finally came to visit me for my 26th birthday in New York. And it was the first time she had come to the East Coast. And it was my birthday. So I, I asked if we could go to stay in Maine for a few days because I'd never been and I wanted to like, go to a cabin on a lake. And um, so she came up and we drove to Maine and I was kind of dropped it on her that like, hey, guess what? On this weekend, we're gonna uh, start working on that book. And she was, well, I thought she would be mad or something, but she was like, all right, great. And so um, the first time we started working on it, we were just kind of both away from our lives um, and our other work. And we sat on a screened in porch on this uh, lake in Maine. And I had my laptop out and I just started to ask my mom questions that it literally was just like, all right, you just died. What now? And then I just typed and typed. And over the next few days, we just did that a lot. And um, I think over that time, we started to realize that it could be a book for a wider audience than just me and my brothers. Um, because I suddenly was like, Oh, I want to illustrate this. This would be really cool. Um, so we kind of talked about what kind of book it would be and kind of envisioned it more. And by the time we left Maine, we were both on the same page as far as like, all right, let's try to actually do this like big. And so um, we ended up doing a couple more writing retreats, basically, um, where we would both meet somewhere that was not our home. So we met in Portland, Oregon, and then we met in Big Sur. And we would just kind of hole up somewhere and work on it and squabble and uh, get frustrated. And <laughs> a lot of cooking, a lot of cooking, um, a lot of like taking little breaks. And it was so, yeah, it was very much like we kind of took ourselves out of our our uh, respective grooves to like dedicate time to it do you want to add anything mom oh, oh no I was I was um I was just uh it was it was a very fascinating process and I was just thinking about the main trip which was the beginning and uh it was beautiful there was a little cabin and a kayak nearby and but Hallie's questions you know I just had no idea what she was going to ask and I just found it fascinating to know what she you know, my child wanted to know, and it's just, um, it's a incredible exercise. If we never wrote a book from it and just did the exercise of doing that, it was very thought provoking and emotional. And at times we just, um, I mean, I remember the first thing she said was, well, what do I do on the first day? And I, 
I'm going like, yeah, what do I tell her? And then I said, so we'll make, make fajitas. And I'd like break out laughing and, and um, because it's, you know, it's a ridiculous suggestion because when you're really grief stricken, the last thing you can do is bring it to, but I found that funny. And, and the point is that you just, you're not going to be good for much necessarily. So you might as well distract yourself with something that's uh, complex like fajitas. And, but I just, it was the fun and the emotional connection that we gained from it. That was just wonderful. And it, each trip was different. It became more, of a, 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 you know, trying to complete an actual project, which has its um, deadlines because I could only be gone from work for, you know, five days at a time. But the um, the emotional thing that we experienced through it was uh, just unforgettable. It was so worth it. And we, we touched on some, some uh, topics that you just typically don't in your three times a year family gatherings at the holidays. You don't go down these roads that are as emotionally um, uh, charged and as interesting. And it's, it's just so worth it. I would really hope that one thing that happens from people reading the book is that they're inspired to connect with their, whether it's their mom or their dad or another family member. It's just very special to go below the surface. I was just remembering one of the arguments we had. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, we were on the one that was like, what do I do if I really want to like talk to you, but you're dead? <laughs> like, I really want to like tell you something, but you're dead. And you were like, you should just text me. And I was like, mom, are you really going to keep a posthumous cell phone account uh, so that like somewhere someone's going to be receiving these text messages? And you were like, like you weren't thinking logistically. You were just like, yeah, just send me a text. And I had to call my brother Nick and I was like, tell mom, this is crazy. And I had to like fight you, you down. Right. And even better book. If you got a text from the afterlife, how we look at it that way. <laughs> okay. I think it would be cool, but it's also really creepy to just know. <laughs> like, yeah, I won that one, but yeah, it was, um, it was a lot of like trying to fight my instinct to become a bratty child who just wants like, I think when you're around your parent, even no matter what age you are, sometimes you just revert. And I think yeah, yeah. my mom and I, like, trying to be professional with each other, but also be mother and daughter, like, I would, I would just kind of have to catch myself or fail to catch myself, like, being a total brat and then <laughs> be like, mom we don't have to write that. I'm going to illustrate it. God. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, on, honestly, the truth is I was, compl I was just not aware of what Hallie was a driving force. And I wasn't aware that she wanted to do a graphic memoir. So I, you know, I have all the words in the world because, you know, writers like to write and they, they want extra words all the time. And so Hallie had to, she, she knew that it was, going to be in this form and honestly I didn't because that was something we didn't particularly discuss and uh, so there was a lot of a uh, lot of editing and finally I understood what she wanted uh, and so I was able to really sharply condense but I had page after page of laborious advice that we condensed down into this and um, you know I'm, I'm so glad and I understood after um, I began to see her drawings what, what her intent was. And I really, I love how it turned out, but, you know, I hardly knew what a graphic um, presentation was to begin with in terms of a graphic novel or, you know, that's, that's a, uh, that's not quite in my uh, tool. Well, you, know, you know what a graphic novel was. I just don't think you had worked that way before. So like, well, actually that's what I mean. I knew what yeah. it was but I just didn't somehow I saw this as being a lot more arduously wordy than it, than it turned out to be. And I'm, I'm happy, but you had to kind of teach me that that was the direction we were headed. And really what we got rid of, I don't miss because the illustrations just, just add such an incredible dimension. And now I really understand what Hallie probably had in mind all along. And um, the illustrations just are uh, stunning to me. I would definitely say, I think that one of the great things about graphic novels is the way you can convey information in a very, in a different way, like in the section, the smile and nod section, where you have one page 
of what people are going to say and one page of how not to respond and just the back and forth <laughs> with the talking bubbles. I just right. think that's that's a great way to put that information. Otherwise, it'd be like, oh, here's a list of things. Or you could do it in this really nice way that's visually pleasing. And also, it just feel there's a certain feeling you get with when you see something in a graphic format, especially if you're talking about anything grief related. Right. Oh, that's so true. And that's what I really came to see. It was like Christmas for me when I got, when Hallie sent a new illustration. I mean, the one where the girls um, early on where she's laying with the cat, that just says something that words, you know, you just get it by instantly that she is in the throes of a profound grief and, She's just uh, knocked back and it just, it says so much. And I really came to understand that by seeing Hallie's work on this. So now Susie, you mentioned that at least initially you weren't seeing this project as a graphic novel or a graphic, uh, whatever you may choose to call it, a memoir in, in some ways, but, but Hallie, this was your idea almost from the beginning. Um, I think that once we were in Maine and we started to write and we realized that maybe this would be something for a wider audience, I started to see it in illustrated form. And I did, for some reason, I did from the very beginning, I was certain that it needed to be painted the way it was with gouache. Um, My work is typically ink and watercolor line drawings that's kind of like scratchy and and messy and I had done a few paintings with gouache that I actually I hated how time consuming it was I I love to be able to produce things quickly but for some reason the subject matter of this book and the tone that we wanted to hit I just never had any doubt that I wanted to paint it even though I was terrified of how much work it would be um and it was a ton of work um but I think I was right and I think I had I had that instinct for a reason I wanted I wanted there to be some more depth to these than than a line drawing I think there's some kind of more you can be playful and serious more easily at the same time at least for me in these paintings that's what I was kind of going for and something that that you would want to look at for longer than a glance along with uh, that that initial question Hallie I'm wondering if in the process of you and your mother trying to to tease out and to give form to what eventually became what to do when I'm gone did you think at some point of if this being some kind of uh you know graphic text making it more comics-like. And what I mean by that is, with, I don't know, one or two exceptions, we really don't have pages that have multiple panels. I mean, there's definitely a sequential nature to this, but it's not a comic or a graphic novel, at least as most people understand it. But I tell you, what it reminded me a lot of is a, the kind of work that you find from actually another Bloomsbury author, and that is Ross Chast, uh, most recently yeah. her book, Going Into Town. It's something that may or may not be described as a comic, but it definitely is a graphic narrative of some sort. But you're doing something com- somewhat similar to what Ross Chast does, I think, in your handling of illustration and juxtaposing it with text. Yeah, I mean, my work in, you know, outside of this book, I do a lot of comics. Um, I don't know that it never to me felt like a panel type thing because the, you know, when you're when you're doing work for the Internet, like it really lends itself to panels and things that you like scroll down and it develops or something but I loved being able to think in the terms and the shape of a book for this so you know the you don't have panels you have pages and I can use the whole page like I've never really done a book with this extent of illustration where I have like a whole spread to work with and can play with the layouts of that and play with the placement of text and all that so I I loved being able to think like off 
offline <laughs> because so much of my work has been online. Um, so it just felt like something to think about this format specifically, um, how to use the shape of a book in the best way. That's a good point about uh, online. You can have it, anything as big or as expansive as you want, but with mm-hmm. a book, you're kind of limited as far as how, where you can place things and how, and also like, I know people talk about the struggle of like, okay, how is the reader going to interpret this, especially if it goes across multiple pages? So there's a lot. I mean, it's impressive the amount of work that really goes into the thought process on how to do a layout for something like this. Yeah. And um, I think that's something that we, we like wanted to be really careful thinking about and our editors at Bloomsbury were, really amazing to work with as far as like making the finished product really beautiful. Cause I think what sets this apart besides just the format is that like everything I've made on the internet is often like someone will read it within the week that it comes out. And then it's like basically never mentioned again. And this book is like a physical object. And it's also something that we designed for people to, share with their loved ones and to hang on to and to refer back to like I designed it for myself to refer to like when the day comes and so it's supposed to be kind of a a beautiful lasting totem (laughs) type of thing yeah that's interesting Um, like the internet is seen as more ephemeral I guess where with the book did you feel extra pressure then to be like well this is like for this is this is forever as like <laughs> unless i mean everything te- anything on the internet is technically forever too but like you're saying if it's more of a ephemeral thing as opposed to the book did you feel any kind of extra pressure then for the book i think i felt i think i feel kind of a similar responsibility to all of my work but um yeah this was a project that we Like, each page took me about three days, depending, and that's a, that's not something that can be rushed, and it's not, it's not a small task, so I kind of had to dispel any feelings of nervousness and pressure and just create a work environment that I could just sit down every single day and have a, have a productive day and not, like, it's definitely the longest term project I've ever done. And so I had to just approach it in a very like practical, steady way that was like, I'm going to try to get one page done in these days. And I crossed them off the list that was hanging by my desk every day. And it was not something that was driven by too much anxiety or anything because I just had to plan it really carefully. I don't know, and I don't want to get too personal, but I'm curious if you have been able to take some of your mother's suggestions on what to do after she passes and apply it to your own relationships or your own family that you have now, or if this is something that you highly anticipate utilizing to your own children. Um, Well, I... I'm flipping through it right now to kind of (laughs) um, look through them. But um, luckily, I haven't used any of the ones that are directly about my mom dying. Um, But, yeah, I mean, a month ago, I moved in with my boyfriend. um, First time I've ever lived with anyone. And there's a page in the book that's like, we've talked about living together, but how do we know if it's the right time? And for like the last year, I've thought about her answer, which is when you'd rather be together night and day than apart. Um, And in the same spread, um, I ask her about what if we start to take each other for granted or what, like I have all these doubts about marriage. Like, what do we do about that? And um, I mean, I was absolutely asking those questions from like, you know, from a, like, I really wanted to know her answers. And, um, I think about that stuff a lot. Um, that's kind of in the background of my life decisions or even I talked to, uh, 
talking to a friend who's like heartbroken, like I'll use my mom's advice on a, a broken heart, which is like make curry. Like, <laughs> yeah. Now to be fair, you never wanted my advice until you hit the age of 23. Prior to that, it wasn't, I, I, I don't think it was welcome. <laughs> advice on what though? Anything. No, I Anything. wanted your advice. I just didn't want to talk to you about boys. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, that's perfectly fair. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's also that section, Susie, where you give Hallie suggestions on whether or not she may be ready for her own kids. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, that's, that's, yeah. If people that can make plans and stick to them and, and that life progresses that way, it always surprises me because it never did for me. So, <laughs> so. But planning is a good thing. We like planning. But I think a, a lot of people, no matter what they plan, those kids come as a surprise. My sister just recently had a baby. And we, that's something we're kind of telling her about. Because she's like, well, we're if this happens, I'm going to do this. And if this happens, we're going to do this. Like, Or, you know, you don't know how, what, you know, you don't, you can't, you can try to plan. But you never know. You're, you hope you're, you're. I, t- I told my sister that I hope her kid hates hates the Packers because that's just what would happen. <laughs> like, that's, that's, you know, you 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 make a lot of plans and, you know, you just never you never know. But like you said, it's always good to plan. I guess plan to what's the if uh, life is what happens when you're making. Other yeah. Plans. Or like, oh, yeah. You, you plan, God laughs. There's like a million that, of those. There's like, yeah, and that that is so true. And you you know, in the, in the realm of having kids, and then boy, your your life is on a different track with a lot of um a uh, lot of surprises along the way. Definitely, it, it, when your life plan involves other human beings, I think you should always <laughs> plan that stuff could go crazy. Oh, well, that's absolutely true. Well, speaking of planning, um. I'm curious. Now, this book comes out this first week of April, which is about maybe a tad more than a month before Mother's Day. Is this something that Bloomsbury wanted to release, I mean, with Mother's Day in mind? So we have a month leading up, or we will soon have a month leading up to that holiday. Is this something that the, I guess, the marketing or publicity department talked with you guys about, hey, we gonna, we're going to release it at this time because we think that it would be the most opportune? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they, um, and, and, and they, they had in mind um, more than one market for this, not just mother-daughter, but because uh, early on I asked the editor Nancy there that, um, what, what do you, we had another, another company that was interested in the book and, but then they ultimately said, gosh, we're just, we're just not sure who, who really would read it. What, you know, what categories of people. And when, when I asked, um, um, Nancy at Bloomsbury that she rattled off about five or six categories of people she thought would find this, uh, um, interesting. I said everyone. Yeah. Cause everyone is going to die. <laughs> 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 yeah so so but certainly the timing you know they wanted to to tie it to mother's day as a start and um and uh makes sense it's a good idea i think that's a good point about the audience could i mean i reading it myself i was thinking how me i'm reading it from a certain perspective but my mom reading it because my grandmother died somewhat recently, so it's like her reading it after that, after the fact, she would have a completely different perspective on it. And, you know, my sister, who just had a baby, would have a completely different perspective on it. And just anybody who's ever had to deal with a, any kind of loved one passing or, I mean, it's just good advice for life and kind of makes you think okay. about, oh, maybe, you know, time is finite and maybe I should think about these things and cherish my relationships and forgive people and all that sort of thing. And, and the funny thing is I, I came, and you, this sounds like, you know, I'm the world's slowest person, but, but I came to that realization in the course of writing the advice and putting things in sequence because I, yeah, you just, you just think, oh, you know, I guess, I guess other people die. It's probably not me. Cause I can't quite fathom my own death. <laughs> the fact that there's a, 
that there's a window on this existence of ours. And really, I this just caused me to really examine my life and my relationship with my kids and with other people too. But it's funny because in the course of looking at it, we'd write some section and just, oh, wow. And, you know, th- there's a part when I'm dead and it's Hallie's first birthday and we're writing it and I'm telling her what I'd advise her on her on the first birthday after my death. And I, I break out crying because it never occurred to me that I'm going to miss a birthday of Hallie's. You know, how... How slow does that? It just, it's, I think we just shield ourselves in, in order to be able to move forward and function and, and uh, go to work every day instead of, you know, playing all the time. So I think that the, the page where mom, you write that um, when we lose our parent, it's like this jarring thing that we're next up on the diving board, like to right. the abyss. Um, I feel like that's so true because even our experience writing the book, like sometimes I would get really uh, afraid or that, that this was like so weird. This must be so weird for you to, to be talking about your own death and, and all the questions are coming from me alive, Hallie to you, dead Susie. And like, the diving board thing is so true because I'm not even considering that like, that's going to be me someday. I'm just like, Oh man, what am I going to do here in this life without like my mom? Um, well, that's well, why I'm so kind of living with my head in the dirt about the fact that that's absolutely, absolutely going to be me. Well, and, and I think that, you know, I, I was in my, uh, in my late forties when my mom died and my sister who's nine years older. And I just looked at each other and said, wow, we're, we're, we're the next, we're the next, it just hits you. And I think it doesn't hit you at the age of 28. It hits you later in life when you've, yeah. you've, you've gone on more and you've seen more people die. But the, when, when that parent generation goes and you are next up and it's just this continuing kind of reminder or re realization that, that, um, well, time is short, and it gets shorter the older you get. And uh, what do you want to what do you want to do with that time? So, it, but there there's a big shock when you when both parents are gone, in particular. I think it definitely points out. I mean, it hits you really hard that if your parent dies, your life as you know it is just completely gone. And I think be, getting the realization that there is no constant anymore is <laughs> extremely jarring because there's always like oh well my you know there's either if there's anything there my mom or my dad or whoever they're always going to be there and they're a part of my life and they're a fat part of the fabric of my life and once that's gone it feels like anything could happen so it's like there's a you don't feel safe necessarily anymore i'm an emotional anchor and that's right. why you need a book. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I will say I called my mom after everything was finally turned in and I wasn't working on the paintings anymore. I I remember mom calling you from a gas station and I was just like, I feel so like I like I thought I would feel better. I thought like having it this mm-hmm. like be done and like it's becoming real and I'm like I'm still just really scared (laughs) and I don't remember what you said but you were just like you kind of tried to say something wise that I'm sure helped me for a minute but it just was kind of that thing (laughs) of like I thought I did you know I did everything I could illustrating this whole guide for myself my future self and I'm kind of no less afraid of that moment but I do think that the process of writing this together and and going through this amazing experience is like its own it was like our own way of I think like we covered all this ground that we didn't have to cover like we all know that this is going to happen to us and we kind of don't confront it until it's too late and I felt like when we were working on it even though it doesn't fix everything, I still felt like, like we were just so smart for like hacking it and like, yeah, we're talking about all this stuff. Like, I know what my mom would say. Like, that's the biggest thing that like, I'm still afraid it's still going to be awful, but I do know like 
basically what she would say. And I think the book really gave me that sense of like a much better sense of my mom's voice and how she would, what she would say about anything. Which is kind of a neat exercise too for other families. Cause you go, okay, what would my mom say? And oh, there's my, my mom, she had a couple things she said and, and it's just something when you hear it, it brings that person back to you. And she used to say, if there's somebody she didn't particularly like that she thought was really like an irritant that she kind of wished would go away, she would, <laughs> think, well, how, you know, how'd your lunch go? And she would say, um, just very quietly, it was, well, it was interesting. <laughs> and by that, she meant, you know, because she didn't want to say something dreadful about the person, but she, you could tell she was never going to make that lunch date again. And, and just these funny little um, little things that equal your the person that you love. And um, to, what you'd call her on the phone later in life and, and say, how are you doing? And she'd say, I'm here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like That's the best she could muster. And, and maybe it was a good thing that she was here versus not being here. So, but it's just funny, those little things that are the voice, whether you, you, you write it in a personal history that you record with your parent, which is wonderful, or you do video or audio boy, that when that comes back to you, it has a lot of emotional impact. Well, Susie, you had mentioned earlier that there was or at least when you were initially thinking about this project, you thought of it as containing much more text than um, it mm-hmm. it actually has. I guess this is a two part question that I have. One: Are there parts that you guys decided to cut out that were particularly painful to cut out? And then, along with that, um, might this be something in some form or another that you two can carry on in another project? Good question. Um, Hallie, you might, I have a terrible memory, but I don't recall cutting out parts except I wrote, I would go off on tangents and write little checklists of, I don't know why I think I have all the advice in the world, but I'd write little checklists and I thought they were funny and th- those went on the cutting room floor because... What were the checklists about? I kind of forgot. I'd have to look back in the documents. Okay. They were You know, um, you know, when you're crossing the street, when you get a traffic, just 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 an odd stuff that I've got somewhere in a file. And so I think I think if anything, we we actually had to add a little bit because when we saw the project in, say, three quarters along the way, Callie would call me and we'd go, gosh, I forgot to ask you anything about getting married or a relationship. And I forgot to ask you about this. And then when I looked at the sequence of life events. Well, you know, I got to some point, I go, well, we've got to have something where you're waiting to hear some dreadful health news because, you know, that's, that's in our life. We have those scary moments. So we actually added quite a bit. And at the very end, the editors had us add a section that, that dealt with friends responding to help you an additional section on friendship and, and the friend support during grief period. So I think the answer is no. Um, we, we, I cut out some miscellaneous stuff, but we added things at the end in order to flesh it out into a, a full life basically. And, and on your second question in terms of the, um, Another project. I personally have another project in mind that I would love Tally to collaborate on, and and um, and we'll be talking about that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's about what to do um, during other situations of grief, such as divorce, or and it's uh, my thought is you know what to do when you're dumped. And, and, uh, there's, there's a lot of women I've talked to over the years that are just, it's, it's another case when you feel like you're very lonely and isolated and you need some support, but people find it hard to give to you. You know, when you're grieving the death of someone, boy, you sure find out who has trouble talking about death because people feel quite awkward. They don't know what to say. And it's just uh, so I just to me, the whole realm of loss in many forms uh, is fascinating to me, probably because I've interviewed so many elderly people who who are weighing up their life at the end of their life. And the grief is some of them have lost 
number of children. Maybe they made it in their 90s, but they lost children along the way. And it's just, there's so much to talk about. And I like the idea of writing something that encourages families to have conversations about what are sometimes very difficult subjects that the previous generation may not have wanted to discuss in any form. So that's, that's something that I would like to, to talk about with Hallie. Now, do the two of you have any plans to help promote the book over the next few weeks? Yeah, we are um, going to New York uh, later this week, actually, together to go to a, there's a gallery opening where some of the original paintings are going to be um, on display at Picture Room Gallery in Brooklyn um, alongside Roz Chast and uh, a couple other New Yorker um, cartoonists. So that'll be really fun. And then later, um, the week after, we're doing um, kind of a book launch at the same gallery um, to kind of, we're going to do a conversation with Emma Allen and talk about the process of making the book and do signings and stuff like that. Um, and then we have in May, a couple more, um, dates in San Francisco and LA. So, well, Susie and Hallie, I want to thank the two of you for coming on our podcast and discussing your new book, what to do when I'm gone, a mother's wisdom to her daughter. Good luck with, uh, the publicity that you had just mentioned and, uh, uh, you know, have a happy mother's day. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. It was lovely talking to you. Well, that was fun. It was. Not only because this is an insightful and entertaining book, but I found it fascinating to be interviewing a mother-daughter creative team on the podcast. Now, I've interviewed married couples, and I've interviewed childhood friends who work on a title. I've never interviewed a mother-daughter on the Comics Alternative before. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting dynamic, not only because, you know, their relationship to each other, but the subject matter itself, because, you know, we're talking about posthumous advice, and just kind of, there's a lot of different and complex emotions that go into this book, and just the perspectives on it, from, you know, Susie's perspective on giving that advice, and what that means to her, but also um, Hallie's drive to put it together and it being a personal project at first. And um, yeah, I just thought it was a really great dynamic. Yes, it was. And I had a great time talking with both Hallie and Susie. And it, it uh, <laughs> you know, I mentioned in the interview uh, Susie's sense of humor. I mean, that that's one of the big takeaways for me from this book. And I think that anyone reading it will find it not only touching and informative, but also humorous, highly entertaining. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And on, I've mentioned before on Secret Stacks how I love depressing books. Mm -hmm. And just – it, you might want to think because this book deals with death is depressing. It really is not. And when I was done reading it, I felt uplifted and motivated to talk with my mother more and just kind of live a really nice life where, um, you know, I'm forgiving people and all those just building. I really wanted to build more relationships with people when I was done reading it. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we're going to have to do another podcast crossover between the Comics Alternative and the Secret Stacks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be great. Yeah. So something to look forward to in the future. And we do definitely recommend that our listeners check out What to Do When I'm Gone, A Mother's Wisdom to Her Daughter. And if you want to find great comics like this, then you would do well to check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com. Every single month, you're going to find incredible, mind-blowing specials. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your titles there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about our interview with Susie Hopkins and Hallie Bateman. 
If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And Kristen, how can people get in touch with you? Well, you can find more information about Secret Stacks on our website, secretstacks.com. You can email us at secretstackspodcast at gmail.com, or you can send us a tweet. We're at Secret Stacks on Twitter. Those are all really great ways to get a hold of us. Let us know what you think, if you have any questions. And, of course, if you want to download the show, just find us on iTunes, Secret Stacks. And you can find us all over social media as well. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. Kristen, this has been fun, and as I said, I hope we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. It was a pleasure, and I'd love to do it again. Yes, and we will. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Kristen. Take care. Thank you.